Chapter 5, Prince Corin. <clears throat> My dear sister and very good lady, said King Edmund, you must now show your courage, for I tell you plainly, we are in no small danger. <clears throat> what is it, Edmund? asked the queen. <clears throat> it is this, said Edmund. I do not think we shall find it easy to leave Tashbot. While the prince had hope that you would take him, we were honored guests. But by the lion's mane, I think that as soon as he has your flat denial, we shall be no better than prisoners. One of the dwarfs gave a low whistle. <clears throat> I warned your majesties, I warned you, said Salopath the raven. Early in, but not easily out, as the lobster said in the lobster pot. I have been with the prince this morning, continued Edmund. He is little used, more's the pity, to having his will crossed, and he is very chafed at your long delays and doubtful answers. This morning he pressed very hard to know your mind. I put it aside, meaning at the same time to diminish his hopes, with some light common jests about women's fancies, and hinted that his suit was likely to be cold. He grew angry and dangerous. There was a sort of threatening, though still veiled under a show of courtesy, in every word he spoke. <clears throat> yes, said Tumnus, and when I supped with the Grand Vizier last night, it was the same. He asked me how I liked Tashbon, and I, for I could not tell him I hated every stone of it, and I would not lie, told him that now, when high summer was coming on, my heart turned to the cool woods and dewy slopes of Narnia. He gave a smile that meant no good, and said, there is nothing to hinder you from dancing there again, little goat foot always provided you leave us in exchange a bride for our prince. Do you mean he would make me his wife by force? exclaimed Susan. That's my fear, Susan, said Edmund. Wife or slave, which is worse. <clears throat> but how can he? Does the Tisrock think our brother, the High King, would suffer such an outrage? <clears throat> Sire, said Peridan to the king. They would not be so mad. Do they think there are no swords and spears in Narnia? Alas, said Ed, my guess is that the Tisrock has very small fear of Narnia. We are a little land, and little lands on the borders of a great empire were always hateful to the lords of the great empire. He longs to blot them out, gobble them up, when first he suffered the prince to come to care Pervel as your lover, sister, it may be that he was only seeking an occasion against us. Most likely he hopes to make one mouthful of Narnia and Archenland both. Let him try, said the second dwarf. At sea we are as big as he is, and if he assaults us by land, he has desert to cross. <clears throat> True friend said Edmund. But is the desert a sure defense? What does Salopad say? I know that desert well, said the raven, for I have flown above it far and wide in my younger days. You may be sure that Shasta pricked up his ears at this point. And this is certain, that if Tisrock goes by the great oasis, he can never lead a great army across it into Archimedes. For though they could reach the oasis by the end of their first day's march, yet the springs there would be too little for the thirst of all those soldiers and their beasts. But there is another way. Shasta listened more attentively still. He that would find that way, said the raven, must start from the tombs of the ancient kings and ride northwest so that the double peak of Mount Pyre is always straight ahead of him. And so, in a day's riding or a little more, he shall come to the head of a stone valley, 
which is so narrow that a man might be within a furlong of it a thousand times and never know that it was there. And looking down this valley, he will see neither grass nor water nor anything else good. But if he rides on down it, he will come to a river and can ride by the water all the way into Archon land. And do the Calormines know of this western way? asked the queen. Friends, friends, said Edmund, what is the use of all this discourse? We are not asking whether Narnia or Calamon would win if war arose between them. We are asking how to save the honor of the queen and our own lives out of this devilish city. For though my brother, Peter, the high king, defeated the Tisrock a dozen times over, yet long before that day, our throats would be cut and the queen's grace would be the wife, or more likely, the slave of this prince. We have our weapons, King, said the first dwarf, and this is a reasonably defensible house. As to that, said the King, I do not doubt that every one of us would sell our lives dearly at the gate, and they would not come at the Queen, but over all dead bodies. Yet we should be merely fighting rats in a trap when all's said. Very true, croaked the raven. These last stands in a house make good stories, but nothing ever came of them. After their first few repulses, the enemy always sets the house on fire. <clears throat> I am the cause of all of this, said Susan, bursting into tears. Oh, if only I had never left Care Paravel. Our last happy day was before those ambassadors came from Calamon. The moles were planting an orchard for us. Oh, oh, and she buried her face in her hands and sobbed. Courage, Sue, courage, said Edmund. Remember, but what is the matter with you, Mr. Tumnus? For the fawn was holding both his horns with his hands as if he were trying to keep his head on by them and writhing to and fro as if he had a pain in his inside. Don't speak to me, don't speak to me, said Tums. I'm thinking, I'm thinking so that I can hardly breathe. Wait, wait, do wait. There was a moment's puzzled silence, and then the fawn looked up, drew a long breath, mopped his forehead, and said, The only difficulty is how to get down to our ship, with some stores too, without being seen and stopped. Yes, said a dwarf dryly, just as the beggar's only difficulty about riding is that he has no horse. Wait, wait, said Mr. Tubbs impatiently. All we need is some pretext for going down to our ship today and taking stuff on board. Yes, said King Edmund doubtfully. Well then, said the father. How would it be if your majesties bade the prince to a great banquet to be held on board our own galleon, the Splendor Hailing, tomorrow night, and let the message be worded as graciously as the queen can contrive without pledging her honor, so as to give the prince a hope that she is weakening? <clears throat> that is very good counsel, sire, croaked the raven. And then, continued Tumnus excitedly, everyone will expect us to be going down to the ship all day, making preparations for our guests, and let some of us go to the bazaars and spend every minimum we have at the fruit years and the sweet meat sellers and the wine merchants, just as we would if we were really giving a feast. And let us order magicians and jugglers and dancing girls and flute players all to be on board tomorrow night. I see, I see, said King Edmund, rubbing his hands. And then, said Tummies, we'll all be on board tonight. And as soon as it is quite dark, up sails and out oars, said the king. And so does sea cried Tumnus, leaping up and beginning to dance. 
and our nose northward, said the first dwarf. Running for home, hurrah for Narnia and the north, said the other. And the prince waking the next morning and finding his birds flown, said Peridin, clapping his hands. Oh, Master Tumnus, dear Master Tumnus, said the queen catching his hands and swinging with him as he danced. You have saved us all. The prince will chase us, said another lord, whose name Shasta had not heard. That's the least of my fears, said Edmund. I have seen all the shipping in the river, and there's no tall ship of war nor swift galley there. I wish he may chase us, for the splendid for the splendor hailing could sink anything he has to send after her, if we were overtaken at all. Sire, said the raven, you shall hear no better plot than the fawns, though we sat in council for seven days. And now, as we birds say, nests before eggs, which is as much as to say, let us all take our food and then at once be about our business. Everyone arose at this, and the doors were opened, and the lords and the creatures stood aside for the king and queen to go out first. Shasta wondered what he ought to do, but Mr. Tumnus said, <clears throat> Lie there, your highness, and I will bring you up a little feast to yourself in a few moments. There is no need for you to move until we are all ready to embark. Shasta laid his head down again on the pillows, and soon he was alone in the room. This is perfectly dreadful, thought Shasta. It never came into his head to tell these Narnians the whole truth and ask for their help. Having been brought up by a hard, close-fisted man like Arshish, he had a fixed habit of never telling grown-ups anything if he could help it. He thought they would always spoil or stop whatever you were trying to do. And he thought that even if the Narnian king might be friendly to the two horses, because they were talking beasts of Narnia, he would hate Aravis because she was a Kalarmin, and either sell her for a slave or send her back to her father. As for himself, I simply don't tell them I'm not Prince Gorin now, thought Shasta. I've heard all their plans. If they knew I wasn't one of themselves, They'd never let me out of this house alive. They'd be afraid I'd betray them to the Tisra. They'd kill me. And if the real Corin turns up, it'll all come out. And they will. He had, you see, no idea of how noble and freeborn. He had no idea of how noble and freeborn people behave. What am I to do? What am I to do? He kept saying to himself. What? Hello? Here comes that goaty little creature again. The fawn trotted in, half dancing with a tray in his hands, which was nearly as large as himself. This he set on an inlaid table beside Shasta's sofa and sat down himself on the carpeted floor with his goaty legs crossed. Now, princeling, he said, make a good dinner. It will be your last meal in Tashpan. It was a fine meal after the Calarmine fashion. I don't know whether you would have liked it or not, but Shasta did. There were lobsters and salad and snipe stuffed with almonds and truffles and a complicated dish made of chicken livers and rice and raisins and nuts. And there were cool melons and gooseberry fool, fools and mulberry fools and every kind of nice thing that can be made with ice. There was also a little flagging on the sort of wine that is called white, though it is really yellow. While Shasta was eating, the good little fawn, who thought he was still dazed with sunstroke, kept talking to him about the fine times he would have when they all got home, about his good old father, King Loon of Archenland, and the little castle where he lived on the southern slopes of the pass. And don't forget, said Mr. Tongue that you are promised your first suit of armor and your first war horse on your next birthday. And then your highness will begin to learn how to tilt and joust. 
and in a few years, if all goes well, King Peter has promised your royal father that he himself will make you knight at Herr Paravel. And in the meantime, there will be plenty of comings and goings between Narnia and Archerland across the neck of the mountains. And of course, you remember, you have promised to come for a whole week to stay with me for the summer festival. And there will be bonfires and all night dances of fawns and dryads in the hearts of the woods. And who knows, we might see Aslan himself. When the meal was over, the fawn told Shasta to stay quietly where he was. And it wouldn't do you any harm to have a little sleep, he added. I'll call you in plenty of time to get on board. And then home, Narnia and the North. Shasta had so enjoyed his dinner and all the things Tumnus had been telling him that when he was left alone, his thoughts took a different turn. He only hoped now that the real Prince Corin would not turn up until it was too late, and that he would be taken away to Narnia by ship. I am afraid he did not think at all of what might happen to the real Corin when he was left behind in Tashbar. He was a little worried about Aravis and Bree waiting for him at the tombs, but then he said to himself, Well, how can I help it? And anyway, that Aravis thinks she's too good to go about with me, so... She can jolly well go all alone. And at the same time, he couldn't help feeling that it would be much nicer going to Narnia by sea than toiling across the desert. When he had thought all this, he did what I expect you would have done if you had been up very early and had a long walk and a great deal of excitement and then a very good meal and were lying on a sofa in a cool room with no noise in it except when a bee came buzzing in through the wide open window. He fell asleep. What woke him was a loud crash. He jumped up off the sofa, staring. He saw at once from the mere look of the room, the lights and the shadows all looked different, that he must have slept for several hours. He saw also what had made the crash. A costly porcelain vase which had been standing on the window sill lay on the floor broken into about 30 pieces. But he hardly noticed all these things. What he did notice was two hands gripping the window sill from outside. They gripped harder and harder getting white at the knuckles, and then up came a head and a pair of shoulders. A moment later, there was a boy of Shasta's own age sitting astride the sill with one leg hanging down inside the room. Shasta had never seen his own face in a looking glass. Even if he had, he might not have realized that the other boy was, at ordinary times, almost exactly like himself. At the moment, this boy was not particularly like anyone, for he had the finest black eye you ever saw, and a tooth was missing. And his clothes, which must have been splendid ones when he put them on, were torn and dirty, and there was both blood and mud on his face. Who are you? said the boy in a whisper. Are you Prince Corin? said Shasta. Yes, of course said the other. But who are you? I'm nobody. Nobody in particular, I mean, said Shasta. King Edmund caught me in the street and mistook me for you. I suppose we must look like one another. Can I get out the way you've got in? Yes, if you're any good at climbing, said Corin. But why are you in such a hurry? I say, we ought to be able to get some fun out of this being mistaken for one another. No, no, said Shasta. We must change places at once. I'll be simply frightful if Mr. Tumnus comes back and finds us both here. I've had to pretend to be you. And you're starting tonight, secretly. And where were you all this time? A boy in the street made a beastly joke about Queen Susan said Prince Cor. So I knocked him down. He ran howling into a house and his big brother came out. So I knocked the big brother down. Then 
They all followed me until we ran into three old men with spears who were called the Watch. So I fought the Watch, and they knocked me down. It was getting dark by now. Then the Watch took me along to lock me up somewhere. So I asked them if they'd like a stoop of wine. They said they didn't mind if they did. Then I took them to a wine shop and got them some, and they all sat down and drank till they fell asleep. I thought it was time for me to be off. So I came out quietly and then I found the first boy, the one who had started all the trouble, still hanging about. So I knocked him down again. After that, I climbed up a pipe onto the roof of a house and lay quiet till it began to get light this morning. Ever since that, I've been finding my way back. I say, is there anything to drink? <clears throat> no, I drank it, said Shasta. And now, show me how you got in. There's not a minute to lose. You better lie down on the sofa and pretend. But I forgot. It'll be no good with all those bruises and black eye. You'll just have to tell them the truth. Once I'm safely away. What else did you think I'd be telling them? Asked the prince with a rather angry look. And who are you? There's no time said Shasta in a frantic whisper. I'm a Narnian, I believe, something northern anyway, but I've been brought up all my life in Calorman, and I'm escaping across the desert with a talking horse called Bree. And now quick, how do I get away? Look, said Corn, drop from this window into the roof of the veranda, but you must do it lightly on your toes or someone will hear you. Then along to your left, and you can get up to the top of that wall if you're any good at all as a climber. Then along the wall to the corner, drop onto the rubbish heap, and you'll find outside. And there you are. Thanks, said Shasta, who was already sitting on the sill. The two boys were looking into each other's faces and suddenly found that they were friends. Goodbye, said Corin. And good luck. I do hope you get safe away. Goodbye, said Shasta. I say, you have been having some adventures. <laughs> Nothing to yours, said the prince. Now drop lightly, I say, he added as Shasta dropped. I hope we meet in Archerland. Go to my father, King Loon, and tell him you're a friend of mine. Look out, I hear someone coming. Chapter 6, Shasta Among the Tombs. Shasta ran lightly along the roof on tiptoe. It felt hot to his bare feet. He was only a few seconds scrambling up the wall at the far end, and when he got to the corner, he found himself looking down into a narrow, smelly street, and there was a rubbish heap against the outside of the wall, just as Corin had told him. Before jumping down, he took a rapid glance round him to get his bearings. Apparently, he had now come over the crown of the island hill on which Tashban is built. Everything sloped away before him, flat roofs below flat roofs, down to the towers and battlements of the city's northern wall. Beyond that was the river, and beyond the river, a short slope covered with gardens. But beyond that again, there was something he had never seen the like of, a great yellowish gray thing, flat as a calm sea and stretching for miles. On the far side of it were huge blue things, lumpy but with jagged edges, and some of them with white tops. The desert, the mountains, thought Shasta. He jumped down onto the rubbish and began trotting along downhill as fast as he could in the narrow lane, which soon brought him into a wider street where there were more people. No one bothered to look at a little ragged boy running along on bare feet. Still, he was anxious and uneasy till he turned a corner, and there saw the city gate in front of him. Here he was pressed and jostled a bit, for a good many other people were also going out, and on the bridge beyond the gate, the crowd became quite a slow procession, 
more like a queue than a crowd. Out there, with clear running water on each side, it was deliciously fresh after the smell and heat and noise of Tashbar. When once Shasta had reached the far end of the bridge, he found the crowd melting away. Everyone seemed to be going either to the left or right along the riverbank. He went straight ahead up a road that did not appear to be much used between gardens. In a few places he was alone, and a few more brought him to the top of the slope. There he stood and stared. It was like coming to the end of the world for all the grass stopped quite suddenly a few feet before him, and the sand began. Endless level sand, like on a seashore, but a bit rougher because it was never wet. The mountains, which now looked further off than before, loomed ahead. Greatly to his relief, he saw, about five minutes' walk away on his left, what must certainly be the tombs. Just as Bree had described, Great masses of moldering stone, shaped like gigantic beehives, but a little narrower. They looked very black and grim, for the sun was now setting right behind them. He turned his face west and trotted towards the tones. He could not help looking out very hard for any sign of his friend though the setting sun shone in his face so that he could see hardly anything. And anyway, he thought, of course they'll be around on the far side of the farthest tomb, not this side where anyone might see them from the city. <clears throat> there were about 12 tombs, each with a low arched doorway that opened into absolute blackness. They were dotted about in no kind of order, so that it took a long time going round this one and going round that one before you could be sure that you had looked round every side of every tomb. This was what Shasta had to do. There was nobody there. It was very quiet here out on the edge of the desert, and now the sun had really set. Suddenly, from somewhere behind him, there came a terrible sound. Shasta's heart gave a great jump, and he had to bite his tongue to keep himself from screaming. Next moment, he realized what it was. The horns of Tashbon blowing for the closing of the gates. Don't be a silly little coward, said Shasta to himself. Why, it's only the same noise you heard this morning. But there is a great difference between a noise heard letting you in with your friends in the morning and a noise heard alone at nightfall, shutting you out. And now that the gates were shut, he knew there was no chance of the others joining him that evening. Either they're shut up in Tashban for the night, thought Shasta, or else they've gone on without me. It's just the sort of thing that Aravis would do. But Bray wouldn't. Oh, he wouldn't. Now, would he? In this idea about Aravis, Shasta was once more quite wrong. She was proud and could be hard enough, but she was as true as steel and would never have deserted a companion, whether she liked him or not. Now that Shasta knew he would have to spend the night alone, it was getting darker every minute, he began to like the look of the place less and less. There was something very uncomfortable about those great silent shapes of stone. He had been trying his hardest for a long time not to think of ghouls, but he couldn't keep it up any longer. Ow! Oh, Ow! Oh, help! He shouted suddenly, for at that very moment he felt something touch his leg. I don't think anyone can be blamed for shouting if something comes up from behind and touches him, not in such a place, and at such a time when he is frightened already. Shasta, at any rate, was too frightened to run. Anything would be better than being chased round and round the burial places of the ancient kings with something he dared not look at behind him. Instead, he did what was really the most sensible thing he could do. He looked round, and his heart almost burst with relief. What had touched him was only a cat. The light was too bad now for Shasta to see much of the cat, except that it was big and very solid. 
it looked as if it might have lived for long, long years among the tombs, alone. Its eyes made you think it knew secrets it would not tell. Puss, puss, said Shasta. I suppose you're not a talking cat. The cat stared at him harder than ever. Then it started walking away, and of course Shasta followed it. It led him right through the tombs and out on the desert side of them. There it sat bolt upright with its tail curled round its feet and its face set towards the desert and towards Narnia and the north, as still as if it were watching for some enemy. Shasta lay down beside it with his back against the cat and his face towards the tombs. Because if one is nervous, there's nothing like having your face towards the danger and having something warm and solid at your back. The sand wouldn't have seemed very comfortable to you, but Shasta had been sleeping on the ground for weeks and hardly noticed it. Very soon he fell asleep, though even in his dreams he went on wondering what had happened to Bree and Aravis and Huwin. He was wakened suddenly by a noise he had never heard before. Perhaps it was only a nightmare, said Shasta to himself. At the same moment, he noticed that the cat had gone from his back, and he wished it hadn't. But he lay quite still without even opening his eyes, because he felt sure he would be more frightened if he sat up and looked round at the tombs and the loneliness, just as you or I might lie still with the clothes over our heads. But then the noise came again, a harsh, piercing cry from behind him out of the desert. Then, of course, he had to open his eyes and sit up. The moon was shining brightly. The tombs, far bigger and nearer than he had thought they would be, looked gray in the moonlight. In fact, they looked horribly like huge people, draped in gray robes that covered their heads and faces. They were not at all nice things to have near you when spending a night alone in a strange place. But the noise had come from the opposite side, from the desert. Shasta had to turn his back on the tombs, he didn't like that much, and stare out across the level sand. The wild cry rang out again. <clears throat> I hope it's not more lions, thought Shasta. It was, in fact, not very like the lion's roars he had heard on the night when they met Owen and Arabis, and was really the cry of a jackal. But, of course, Shasta did not know this. Even if he had known, he would not have wanted very much to meet a jackal. The cries rang out again and again. There's more than one of them, whatever they are, thought Shasta, and they're coming nearer. I suppose that if he had been an entirely sensible boy, he would have gone back through the tombs nearer to the river, where there were houses, and wild beasts would be less likely to come. But then there were or he thought there were, the ghouls. To go back through the tombs would mean going past those dark openings in the tombs, and what might come out of them. It may have been silly, but Shasta felt he would rather risk the wild beasts. Then, as the cries came nearer and nearer, he began to change his mind. He was just going to run for it, when suddenly, between him and the desert, a huge animal bounded into view. As the moon was behind it, it looked quite black, and Shasta did not know what it was, except that it had a very big, shaggy head and went on four legs. It did not seem to have noticed Shasta, for it suddenly stopped, turned its head towards the desert, and let out a roar, which re-echoed through the tombs and seemed to shake the sand under Shasta's feet. The cries of the other creatures suddenly stopped, and he thought he could hear feet scampering away. Then the great beast turned to examine Shasta. It's a lion. I know it's a lion, thought Shasta. I'm done. I wonder, will it hurt much? I wish it was over. I wonder, does anything happen to people after they're dead? Oh, here it comes. And he shut his eyes and his teeth tight. But instead of teeth and claws, he only felt something warm lying down at his feet, and when he opened his eyes, he said, Why, 
It's not nearly as big as I thought. It's only half the size. No, it isn't even a quarter the size. I do declare it's only the cat. I must have dreamed all that about it being as big as a horse. And whether he really had been dreaming or not, what was now lying at his feet and staring him out of countenance with its big green unwinking eyes was the cat, though certainly one of the largest cats he had ever seen. Oh, puss, gasped Shasta, I am so glad to see you again. I've been having such horrible dreams. And he at once lay down again back to back with the cat, as they had been at the beginning of the night. The warmth from it spread all over him. I'll never do anything nasty to a cat again, as long as I live, said Shasta, half to the cat and half to himself. I did once, you know. I threw stones at a half-starved mangy old stray. Hey, stop that, for the cat had turned round and given him a scratch. None of that said Shasta. It isn't as if you could understand what I'm saying. Then he dozed off. Next morning when he woke, the cat was gone. The sun was already up and the sand hot. Shasta, very thirsty, sat up and rubbed his eyes. The desert was blindingly white, and though there was a murmur of noises from the city behind him, where he sat, everything was perfectly still. When he looked a little left and west, so that the sun was not in his eyes, he could see the mountains on the far side of the desert, so sharp and clear that they looked only a stone's throw away. He particularly noticed one blue height that divided into two peaks at the top and decided that it must be Mount Pyre. That's our direction, judging by what the raven said, he thought, so I'll just make sure of it so as not to waste any time when the others turn up. So he made a good, deep, straight furrow with his foot pointing exactly to Mount Pyre. <clears throat> the next job, clearly, was to get something to eat and drink. Shasta trotted back through the tombs, though, <clears throat> though they looked quite ordinary now, and he wondered how he could ever have been afraid of them and down into the cultivated land by the river's side. There were a few people about, but not very many, for the city gates had been opened several hours, and the early morning crowds had already gone in, so he had no difficulty in doing a little raiding, as Bree called it. It involved a climb over a garden wall, and the results were three oranges, a melon, a fig or two, and a pomegranate. After that, he went down to the river bank but not too near the bridge, and had a drink. The water was so nice that he took off his hot, dirty clothes and had a dip, for, of course, Shasta, having lived on the shore all his life, had learned to swim almost as soon as he had learned to walk. When he came out, he lay on the grass looking across the water at Tashmar, all the splendor and strength and glory of it. But that made him remember the dangers of it, too. He suddenly realized that the others might have reached the tombs while he was bathing, and gone on without me, as likely as not. So he dressed in fright and tore back at such a speed that he was all hot and thirsty when he arrived, and so the good of his bathe was gone. Like most days when you are alone and waiting for something, this day seemed about a hundred hours long. He had plenty to think of, of course, but sitting alone, just thinking is pretty slow. He thought a good deal about the Narnians, and especially about Corin. He wondered what had happened when they discovered that the boy who had been lying on a sofa and hearing all their secret plans wasn't really Corin at all. It was very unpleasant to think of all those nice people imagining him a traitor. But as the sun slowly slowly climbed up to the top of the sky, and then slowly, slowly began going downwards to the west, and no one came and nothing at all happened. He began to get more and more anxious, and of course he now realized that when they arranged to wait for one another at the tombs, no one had said anything about how long. He couldn't wait here for the rest of his life, and soon it would be dark again and he would have another night just like last night, 
a dozen different plans went through his head, all wretched ones, and at last he fixed on the worst plan of all. He decided to wait till it was dark and then go back to the river and steal as many melons as he could carry and set out for Mount Pyre alone, trusty for his direction to the line he had drawn that morning in the sand. It was a crazy idea, and if he had read as many books as you have about journeys over deserts, he would never have dreamed of it. But Shasta had read no books at all. Before the sunset, something did happen. Shasta was sitting in the shadow of one of the tombs when he looked up and saw two horses coming towards him. Then his heart gave a great leap, for he recognized them as Bree and Hoen. But the next moment, his heart went down into his toes again. There was no sign of Aramis. The horses were being led by a strange man, an armed man, pretty handsomely dressed like an upper slave in a great family. Bree and Hwin were no longer got up like pack horses, but saddled and bridled. And what could it all mean? It's a trap, thought Chester. Somebody has caught Aramis, and perhaps... They've tortured her, and she's given the whole thing away. They want me to jump out and run up and speak to Bree, and then I'll be caught too. And yet, if I don't, I may be losing my only chance to meet the others. Oh, I do wish I knew what had happened. And he skulked behind the tomb, looking out every few minutes and wondering which was the least dangerous thing to do.